Thanks for being here today. Um, I'm Kurt Taff. Uh, I'm one of the uh, co-chairs for some work that we've been doing. Oh. <laughs> Give him a round of applause. Let's do it. Uh, I'm a co-chair for uh, some work that we've been doing in the community around juvenile justice and some of the reforms that we're putting in place. Um, I'm also going to be uh, the room moderator uh, for this session, too. So if you need anything, um, let us know. Um, but about five minutes left, we'll make sure that we wrap up and, and uh, have time for questions as well. Um, I'm presenting today with Mandy Biesick. Uh She is the co-chair for our work around juvenile justice, and we've been spending uh, about three years really looking at systems and supports within our community and really asking the question, can we do things better? You know, can we, can we interact with youth and families differently and, and produce a better result? And that's the culmination of our work, this idea of we're moving uh, from collective intentions to collective impact. How many of you have heard collective impact said at least once today or some version of that? Great. So I hope what you're hearing as, as you're attending Rebuilding for Learning is this idea of we're better together, right? Um, things to know as we got into this work, um, this is tough work that, uh, you know, when we started looking at our own systems and how, how they worked or didn't work for kids and families, what we found were, you know, they were well-written policies. We had really good people doing really well-intentioned things, um, but our systems don't work evenly for all kids, and I think we recognize that, and that's part of uh, why we're here today and, and why we're uh, exploring uh, new possibilities, new ways of supporting youth. So today we're uh, really going to be talking about uh, uh, three different things. One is accepting our history. We call that the ill effects of good intentions, right? So all the work that we've done up to this point, um, people wanted to make a difference then too. You know, even some of the things that, that didn't work for kids. Um, and, and part of it is accepting that. Reforming our present, so the system that we put in place, and then sustaining our future. And we've got some exciting things to share but what we believe is long-term infrastructure change uh, that will really position our community to be able to serve kids differently into the future. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mandy. Wow. That's all I got to do? That's great. <laughs> So thank you, Kurt. As Kurt said, I'm Mandy Bisek. I'm the supervisor of juvenile justice for La Crosse County Human Services and also co-facilitated uh, the Juvenile Justice Best Practice Group with Kurt. Um, and so we're super excited to be able to share with you today where things are at with our best practice work. Um, no longer are we the group that sits around talking about what's going on and how we can do things different, but we're actually making the changes and have some introductions to make today to show that those changes are coming to fruition. But before that, we want to lay the foundation for you. So it's about telling you all, sharing with you all where our journey started um, in order to get us to where we're at right now. And so a little bit of history so that we can set the foundation and the stage for um, some of the work that's been going on for the last three years to really get us to the point where we're at right now. So, take you back a little ways. In 2008, the Cary Group came to La Crosse County Human Services and did a study of how the juvenile justice system was working at that point in time. Um, a very intensive scope as far as the ins and outs of what's going on in the, in the practice of juvenile justice within La Crosse County. Uh, pulled in a lot of our stakeholders, pulled in a lot of, of people who are a part of the system. Um, and really came away with uh, many recommendations of how we could make improvements and do a better job to serve the kids within our community. Um, we took those recommendations and ran with them, all but two. Two kind of came and, and went that were untouched for a while because quite frankly, our system just wasn't ready to, to we weren't in a place to talk about it quite yet. And so um, those two were that uh, the, Curie, the Curie Group recommended that we create an interagency task force to really look at what they found while they were doing this study. Why does La Crosse County arrest juveniles at a higher rate than other like-sized counties? And at that point in time, a higher rate than the state of Wisconsin. It wasn't within the scope of the study for the Curie Group to be able to define why that was, but they said, this is what we found while we were here, and guys, you gotta understand this. This is what's going on, and you need to be able to wrap your brain around it to be able to say what's contributing to that. The other thing that the Curie Group left us with 
is that at that point in time, disproportionate minority contact was a big discovery within the state of Wisconsin um, that we had it in our state. And they said, again, this is outside of the scope of what we came to do, but we highly encourage that if your arrest rates are looking like this, you should really start looking at if you have DMC in your community as well. So with that, we put together a task force to tackle those two things with a big, long, fancy name, the Juvenile Justice Arrest and Disproportionate Minority Contact Interagency Task Force. We just didn't even have enough letters to abbreviate all of that. So, so we were the task force. Um, and our job was really to analyze those two questions, really look at our data, understand our system, and understand what was going on with those things that the Cary Group found. So the two questions we needed, three questions we needed to answer. Does La Crosse County still have a relatively high juvenile arrest rate? Is disproportionate minority contact present within our community? And if yes, what are the factors within the juvenile justice system that might be contributing to these things? This particular task force truly was pulled together just to analyze data, really reach some conclusions, and make some recommendations for next steps. So we had a beginning and an end in sight, right, to be able to move forward. So we gathered our troops. Um, we couldn't do this work without truly understanding one another's systems. We're all a, a bigger piece of this puzzle, right? So we all felt that we needed to be around this table to do this, to analyze these th types of things. So we had everyone from the school district to the county to law enforcement, uh, courts, the DA's office, community partners, clergy, anybody who would be touching or making significant decisions about a youth's life within our community were represented at that table because we knew that without being able to have these cross conversations truly understand the ins and outs of each other's systems we weren't going to get anywhere as far as understanding what might be going on in our community so our job was to review the relevant data. We had a, a wonderful relationship established with La Crosse Police Department who was able to really look and analyze that arrest data within our city we gathered to, to review policies, whether that be disciplinary policies, arrest policies, detention policies, anything that might affect along the way those decisions that were being made and really understand those. Um, we were to review the, the information from the Annie E. Casey Foundation that is doing incredible work around the country um, on disproportionate minority contact. We don't need to recreate our own wheel here, folks. We can, we can take the, what others have done within the country and really look how we can um, bring that to our own community. We needed to determine our controllable causes that could be addressed through change in our systems, either through policies, procedures, and programming, and also determine if that was what was safe and good for our public interest and for our community. And then ultimately, it was our job to recommend next steps. Where do we go from here? So first and foremost, we had to answer our questions. Does La Crosse County still have that relatively high juvenile arrest rate? Yeah, the trend continued. And I'll show you a chart here in just a minute um, of what that looks like. Is DMC present in our community? Yeah, as we started crunching numbers, we found that that was tr true as well. And so if those factors were present, we had to come up with what are we going to do about it? Where do we stand as a system? What do we want to do moving forward? And that's where the task force came up with seven conclusions and seven recommendations of how we move forward. So as we talked about, we continued to have that higher arrest rate. The top line here represents La Crosse County. We compared ourselves, as the Cary Group did, to Fond du Lac, Sheboygan, and Walworth counties, similar in makeup of size, system, and things of that nature. As you can see, that top line continues to trend at a higher rate, even beyond where the Cary Group ended their data research at 2006. We continued on and saw that we continued to have that same trend. Um, if you can even see at the very end there, as everybody continues to trend down in their juvenile arrest rates, La Crosse County, for whatever reason, started shooting back up around 2010. We also needed to answer that question about DMC. Is disproportionate minority contact present in our juvenile justice system here locally? What we found, these are just a couple of years of the many that we looked at. In 2012, we were arresting our African-American youth about three times more than their white counterparts. We jumped to 2013 and we're almost at five times more. When we take this into consideration, we're talking about arrest in all areas. So anything from a citation, a smoking citation, all the way to something that would send a kid to Lincoln Hills. That's our gamut that we're talking about um, when we're looking at arrests. So we answered our questions. And we knew that we needed to move forward with how, what are we going to do about this now? How are we going to understand it? And what can we do differently within our system? 
So with those two questions answered, we came to the obvious conclusion that the two probably play relatively close with one another, right? If you have DMC and you have issues with arrest, they're likely combined in many, many ways. Um, the next thing we looked at as a task force was where arrests are occurring. Because we knew as we looked forward, if we wanted to do something, we wanted to know where we would have the most impact. So let's see where juveniles are being most arrested. We were able to come up with kind of our top 10 list of locations and of the thousands that appeared um, on our list of locations of where kids are arrested within the city of La Crosse, these were the ones that came up the most frequently. Now, when you think about it logically, when you have a thousand kids in a school, right, where, they, where kids spend 25% of their awake hours, this is a good location for arrests where arrests might be happening. Kids are together, they might be misbehaving, there could be things that are, are happening, and that's where, where some arrests occurred. So we found that 25% of all the juvenile arrests were occurring at a school within the city of La Crosse. We also found that 15% of all juvenile arrests were happening at one of the locations run by the Family and Children's Center. So those two areas became the areas of our focus, of our efforts moving forward, because we knew that if we were able to really start concentrating in an area, our efforts could then be measured better and more controlled in those areas before we were able to expand community-wide. The fourth conclusion was that there's certain current juvenile justice system practices around arrest and detention needed to be strengthened for quite a few reasons. The first came to one of the first conversations that we had as a task force. A lot of really well-intentioned professional people were around that table. And we could all come to the same conclusion that we're all in this business to help kids, right? At the end of the day, we're not here to lock them up behind bars. We're here to get them the help that they want. The unfortunate piece, and what we'll talk about even more as we go on here, is that what we realize is the only door in this particular avenue that we've created for ourselves is arrest. And so in our only way to get a kid who might be misbehaving at school, we'll use school because that's what we're all here and, and connected to, sometimes to get them a social worker in the system is to hand them out a disorderly conduct charge. Not because necessarily we believe they're a criminal, but we know there's a social worker on the other end of that ar arrest, right? And that social worker can hook up that kid and that family to services to get them back on their feet again. But what we also determined as a, as a group is that's not the door that we want to use for a lot of these kids, right? That we can get them help in other ways, and it was up to, up to us to figure out what that would be. We also found that there was a lack of shared philosophy across the juvenile justice system. By putting all of us together in a room together, we realized that we were having a lot of the same conversations that each other were having behind closed doors. So I learned a lot about PBIS and the, the philosophy and the culture and the beliefs and the relationship building that goes on with PBIS. And that was a lot of the same stuff and conversations that were going on at La Crosse County. So how much stronger can we be when we collaborate and have some of these same philosophies and get on the same page and really start to determine how we as a system want to handle juvenile misbehavior? We found that there was a use of law enforcement as an intervention option in public school disciplinary practices. So in review of not just La Crosse, but all uh, many area school discipline policies, we would find referenced that disorderly conduct charges shall be given for this type of behavior. And that, we felt, was an area that really needed to be addressed. Where does school discipline stop and arrest begin? There wasn't a clear definition or a clear line in some instances, and we felt that needed to be addressed. There was an absence of some key evidence-based practices and approaches within the system, things like objective decision-making tools. Are we making the right decisions about kids getting anywhere from suspended or expelled out of school? Uh, in our office, it's about appropriate use of juvenile detention. Are we objectively making those decisions and ensuring that all kids, no matter their background, are getting treated, e treated equally? There was a misunderstanding of the current role and capacity of the, the, of the county's juvenile justice system. 
A lot of the conversation in this area really talked about the juvenile justice system was created, not just here in La Crosse, but nationally speaking. Juvenile justice system is created for kids who are the most high risk of, of a threat to our community, where an, an instrument of protection needs to be put in place to ensure that criminal activity is not occurring within our community. That's what the juvenile justice system should be reserved for. But as we looked at it, we found that we were really bending the lines as to what we were actually using it for. And then finally, that our roles of our SROs need to be cl more clearly defined across systems. That s SROs often lack access to a broader array of intervention options. This is where we're talking about only having created that one door. That when an SRO, a school resource officer, needs to intervene in a behavioral situation in a school, the only tool we've given them in their toolbox is arrest. And again, they're the well-intentioned. Right? They're sitting at that same table as the rest of us wanting to help this kid, but the only tool that we've given them is that if I hand out a charge, I can get them involved with a social worker who can then have that whole gamut of services available to them. So how do we give our SROs more tools in their toolbox as well? So with all of those conclusions, we needed to have some recommendations of how do we move forward. We can't just, we all concluded at the end of the day, we can't just sit in this room and talk about this. We're not okay with where things were at and something needs, we need to do something different within the system that we're currently running. So a few different recommendations came out of it. As with many, we had to form another task force, right? So first recommendation was to get another group together to really put boots on the ground. So it's no, no longer about sitting around talking about it and analyzing and, and understanding. Now it's about being willing and ready to do something about it. And so the Juvenile Justice Best Practice Group was formulated, um, that's what Kurt and I have been facilitating for the last year and a half, two years, um, to really put those boots on the ground and make some, some change happen. The next area that was recommended is that we create some um, and implement clear gui guidelines that are shared and supported across key juvenile justice system partners. The fashion in which we wanted that instrument to take place was a memorandum of understanding. Um, and you'll hear a little bit more about that. You heard it this morning um, in the opening remarks that Kurt mentioned that we just had an MOU signing here a couple of weeks ago where all of our system partners were able to come together and come to an agreement on those expectations and how we truly want to work with adolescents within all of our systems that we share. You can see, too, that we're a little bit late in our deadline, however. <laughs> um, the third was that we conduct a common system-wide cultural competency training that focuses on juvenile justice issues. This was another key and core part of the, of the conversations and the work that we, um, that we did as a task force. We found that not only do we as a system need to do things different, we sometimes need to think different. So there were a lot of comments made this morning, right, about how we need to look at each and every child as an individual. They all bring their own sets of values, beliefs, culture to the table, and we need to know and understand that. And how can we do that better as a system and really truly meet the individualized needs of each of the kids that come across our desk, the ones that are, are hurting the most and asking for it in all the wrong ways? Um, how do we meet those needs? Uh, the best way that we can. And so not by um, necessarily, and we all, again, have really great intentions and are doing some really wonderful things, but how do we come together to learn together and push ourselves to a, a new place um, when it comes to really understanding cultural, cultural um, sensitivity issues um, and things of that nature? We also then uh, recommended that we work to increase the use of evidence-based practices within our programs throughout the juvenile justice system. Again, going back to you know utilizing more objective decision-making instruments and things of that nature, um, cognitive behavioral, uh, skill-building type of, of interventions to really make true change happen with the kids that we're working with. And then finally, to measure ourselves, to understand that, you know, with the changes that we're making, measure ourselves to make sure that we're having a true impact um, on what we said we were going to do, and to be able to share some common data points and factors, to be able to, to speak with one another about what success looks like across our system. So those recommendations really laid the foundation for what juvenile justice best practice did moving forward for the last couple of years um, to really focus us in and zero us in on what our work was to come. And so that's where I've laid the foundation for you. You know where all of this has come, has come from. Now you get to see the exciting stuff that we have been up to for the last couple of years.
So as you get into this work, you can't help but think back maybe to your uh, childhood, middle school, high school years, and think about some of the things that went on either with you or your, or your friends and, and how maybe the world's changed since then. Um, I, I went to uh, grade school in a Catholic school, and uh, it was during a time where we still had a number of nuns working, and, and nuns are very trusting, but they, as they age, they get forgetful. And uh, we had some guys within our school that uh, got a, a set of keys from one of the nuns to open up a closet door and ran over to Hardware Hank at lunchtime, burned a few copies of that key. And we ended up running some open gyms on the weekend uh, as a result of that to work on our basketball skills and got caught. And I think back, I think back to that, and we didn't, you know, there were no police involved, and there's certainly restitution and writing assignments and lots of prayer and forgiveness. Uh, <laughs> But I think back to that, boy, what would that look like today? You know, and it was uh, very short-sighted, you know, not really thinking about the impact of that. Uh, and it could have been life-changing for, for everybody involved. Um, so you, you, as you kind of think through this and think through the work, is there a common sense way to, to really approach kids and to get back to that, uh, that uh, mentality of, you know, kids are capable of making mistakes and can we work with them in a way when they do uh, that can prevent it in the future? We tried to be really intentional about this work. Uh, and so you see here, we used a framework uh, to really guide our implementation with four stages. First stage being exploration purpose building, asking that question, is this, is this work worth our time, effort, and energy? Right? If we're going to put all of our, our uh, uh, time and, and uh, thought into this, um, is this going to be worth it as an organization, as individuals? Infrastructure and installation is how do we make this right and make it last, right? Um, Mandy and I have really spent a lot of time together here in the last year uh, talking about these ideas and concepts and the systems that need to be in place, all with the intention of making this entire system people-proof, knowing that SROs uh, go on, a lot of our SROs go on to take on administrative positions or detective positions. Um, we have administrators that move on, folks retire, and uh, if we really think this work is that important, we want it to last beyond us. So we've tried to be intentional about that. Initial implementation is just that. Where do we begin? Where do we start? And we'll, we'll talk about that. And then we have some pretty big aspirations and vision for what this could look like in the future, particularly with our, our system of care organization that we're developing. So we're going to work through uh, each of these. Uh, and, and you can see a little bit of how we thought about it and, and how we've built it. So of course, um, just like the task force, our, our juvenile justice best practice work group uh, need a lot of support. We've got a lot of partners and a lot of players within the system that interact with, with youth in different ways. Um, so we made sure that uh, we had folks from the school and folks from our school resource officer group. Um, we also included, you can see here my little laser pointer, um, we have some ideas around scale up. So we are really intentional to include communities who this won't start with. Um, but we've already made sure that there's people there um, that, that um, uh, can help us onboard. Our, uh, one of our first activities around stage one exploration purpose building was a compression planning event with a gentleman named uh, Judge Stephen Teske. Uh, Judge Teske has completed this work uh, near, uh, in Atlanta uh, with the Clayton County system of care. I'm really thinking through a lot of the same thing. The data points that we have are, are not exclusive to La Crosse. We just happen to be one of the few communities in the country doing something about it. Um, but Clayton County ended up bringing their uh, team, their technical assistance team. Um, we were able to work through a number of pieces of this. So defining the problem, what is it, what is it we're, we're out to resolve? Um, understanding the why be behind the what. Why does it make a difference how we interact with kids? What we found out is when we involve kids unnecessarily in the criminal justice system, all sorts of outcomes deteriorate quickly. Um, they're likely for recidivism, to get into more trouble, their grades plummet, their attendance decreases, their opportunity for graduation. And you can kind of see, thinking back, when kids get ensnared in, a, in the criminal justice system, life outcomes can deteriorate. Um, we really spent some time defining the role of the SRO, and we'll talk about what that shaped up, uh, how that's shaped up in our memorandum of understanding. Um, actually developing our agreement that uh, I had mentioned this morning in, in some opening remarks, and then marketing a, a, a social justice partnership. I'll tell you what, it's, it would be real easy for people to, to look at 
uh, the work uh, we've done and be critical about it and say, you know what, this is just another effort to, to be soft on crime. Uh, and what we say is it's the exact opposite. We're just trying to better discriminate actual criminal behavior from behavior that needs help and support. And we're trying to be intentional about that. And I think you'll see that we've, uh, we're pretty close to achieving that. So uh, with reform, um, change is hard, right? Who goes first? Uh, as we looked at this data and uh, these pieces that Manny brought up, I will tell you from a district standpoint, uh, that was uncomfortable to, to, to think, you know, we've got good people, we have good policies, we believe we're doing the right work, but we seem to be contributing in a way that's, that's problematic for some kids, uh, that our system isn't working evenly for all kids, and that's hard to accept. Um, so common, common data understanding, common system understanding, like Mandy said, we spent a lot of time getting to know each other. Um, you know, uh, county didn't realize that we have a full system of positive behavior support within the schools and our coaching infrastructure around that and our staff development. Uh, that goes a long way to make sure that our system partners know, you know, we have a prevention system in place. Of course, shared mission, vision, message, um, uh, shared system improvements. We, we landed at the point where we felt like we all could do something different. Um, that we all have adjustments that we can make. And that's really how we arrived at a memorandum of understanding, uh, really coming together uh, around uh, supporting youth. One of the things that we did different from uh, even the other social justice partnerships that are, are out there is we mapped our full continuum of service here. So you'll see on the left side, you see my pointer up there on the left side, and I know this is uh, small, uh, but this really maps out everything that we're doing in schools around positive behavior support. That we have a system per, for prevention. We have a system to respond to unexpected behavior. We have a system to respond to non-criminal uh, misbehavior. On the right side is what we're proposing to do differently, and we'll talk about focus acts. But as you can see, this isn't soft on crime, this is smart on crime. Uh, that when kids commit serious violent acts, we're going to respond appropriately. Safety is paramount. It's part of our five-year vision uh, within the school district. We just want to be smarter on those behaviors that uh, could benefit from just help and support and intervention. So our infrastructure installation, this is a memorandum of understanding development. So how do we come to this agreement? Uh, we have a couple questions that we ask. How do we better discriminate actual criminal behaviors from adolescent behaviors interpreted as criminal behavior? and behaviors that actually need help and support. And where we landed, and this was a lot of discussion looking at the data, our opportunity for impact, uh, we identified what we call focus acts. And focus acts are uh, minor uh, criminal offenses that are oftentimes um, fall into these two categories, uh, where a disorderly conduct, uh, you know, two, two guys within a, a school get into a uh, fight about a, a girl, or one says one something about the other, right? Uh, not, not probably a crime under most circumstances, especially if it's mutual, mutually organized, um, but certainly something we need to respond to. We need to be able to hold kids accountable for these behaviors through a different system because the criminal justice system isn't good enough. That system is what we refer to as our lacrosse system of care. So this lacrosse system of care is first a systems agreement. So uh, like Mandy said, uh, on August 9th, we had a number of our, our uh, leaders uh, get together to sign a memorandum of understanding. It's between the city, the school, and the county at this point. Um, what we did within that MOU is embed our PBIS system. That, ha that has to be in place moving forward, that we have to have a system of prevention uh, within behavior support. What we also did was define the role of the SRO, and this is uneven all over the country. Uh, SROs uh, are really there to develop relationships with kids and provide for the safety uh, of the school. And there are places uh, where SROs are used as an extension of the administration. They're used for regular school discipline, and that's not the intention of that role. And so we've addressed that to really help clarify uh, why we have SROs within our, within our schools. We also address the use of handcuffs in schools, and here's, here's essentially how it reads. It's not needed unless it is. That we know that when we end up shackling kids, and this is true in front of courts and judges, when you shackle a kid or when you, when you put handcuffs on a, a child, 
their risk for reoffending and for getting deeper in that system skyrockets. And so we want to be really intentional to say if it's a non-criminal act, if, if this uh, student doesn't need to be handcuffed, we're not going to handcuff them in schools and, and you know, march them out the front door. We're going to do something different. So, um, like I said, a focus on non-criminal behavior and then neutral party administration. So this system of care is not owned by the school district. It is not owned by the county. And we're going to talk about what that, what that structure is going to look like and the, the potential it has for the future. This is our system design. So this is a flow chart of what you might expect uh, to happen with a student who enters our system of care. So up here in the top left, you have a school resource officer determines a youth engaged in a delinquent act. One of the first things that we're exploring is, is there a school-based resolution? And these sorts of things are in place already. We have, we have school administrators and school resource officers who are already working with kids, doing informal mediation, informal restitution, uh, using our PBIS interventions. We want to double down on those. If there's a way to resolve it with no involvement in system of care or the SRO, we want to do that. It's what's best for kids. However, if there isn't, and it's a focus act, this, this student is going to have an opportunity to enter that system of care. It is going to require parent consent, so if they don't give consent, we're not able to offer it as an option to them. Uh, but the idea is we would work with parents and say, hey, we have this other door. We think that we can hold your child accountable through a system of supports that will build skill and avoid all the negative consequences of involvement with the, with the criminal justice system. The way our system is going to work is that child will come in, we'll be able to assess needs. So if a child does come in uh, uh, due to fighting, we can assess is that related to anger management, is it related to deficits within social skills, is it related to uh, drug or alcohol issues. And we can pinpoint the intervention based on that need. Our system of care administrator is going to be monitoring progress on the student, so the child needs to continue to participate in the intervention. Uh, and our expectation is once the child successfully completes that, we'll be able to provide aftercare monitoring for a period of time to make sure things are continuing to go well for the student um, before they're, they're completely exited out. Um, but but uh, just like our system of care, uh, we also have our other system to help support when there, when there is an actual crime that's, that's committed. Here's a, a picture of the signing uh, with our signers in, in front there. Um, a couple of uh, uh, articles since then on our system of care. Uh, the bottom one, this, this Our View, Let's Team Up to Help Kids. This is the, editorial, uh, the editorials board's request to, to have other communities jump on. And we're thinking the same way, and that's actually part of the design. As Mandy mentioned, part of the work is intentional justice work. And for the La Crosse Police Department, they've been implementing fair and impartial policing training into the work that they do with their officers. The La Crosse School District just finished our Social Justice Institute in August. Uh, and as part of our system of care, we were able to leverage some grant dollars to train lo six local facilitators to administer the YWCA racial justice training that focuses on communicating across cultures deconstructing racism and exploring privilege. Um, so what you can expect is uh, some information coming about, out of when those will be available. And the idea is that we have uh, folks from all of our organizations attend those and learn together uh, around uh, racial justice. Stage three, initial implementation. So this is really where do we start, right? We've got the infrastructure, we've, we've, we've got the supports. We're going to start within schools. Like Mandy said, 25% of our office referrals, uh, or 25% uh, of our referrals uh, are in schools. This gives us, gives us an opportunity to start implementing that system in five addresses, opposed to 1,000. Um, we believe that we'll be able to get good at it and, and take it to those 1,000, but we're going to start with five. <clears throat> our old system worked a little bit like this. There was an in-school behavior issue and we either figured out in school or we made a, a referral. And that was for all sorts of behaviors, low, moderate, and high behaviors. Our new system of care is a gap filler. The first thing it does is doubles down on our school-based interventions. We think that's a good thing. And then it provides gap support. So uh, if we've ever felt like there's been a point where schools feel like, boy, our services end here, and the county says, well, we can't work with kids till they qualify over here. System of care is that gap filler. 
um, that we no longer have to wait for behaviors to get that bad uh, to be able to respond to them. We think it's going to be huge. Full implementation. We think this is going to be so good for kids in schools. We want to be able to create a system, and we're in early conversations about this, uh, to be able to offer beat officers an opportunity to refer into, com into our system of care. So if something happens at the park on the weekend, um, or, or uh, something happens downtown, and a child would benefit from this sort of support, we could, we could get them that. Um, after we scale up uh, citywide, uh, we want to be able to take this to the county. We truly see a, a, a future uh, where any child in the county, no matter who they are, where they're from, will be able to access the system of care and, and really get the help and support that they need. So we're very excited about that. Next chunk here is on sustaining our future. So this is the bigger system infrastructure uh, that we think is going to be able to support not only reforms within juvenile justice, but also around mental health and, and abuse and neglect. Um, this quote is from Troy Harsey, our associate superintendent. Uh, really this idea of we're moving from the system of collective intentions to collective impact. Uh, that we are working together, we're blending systems uh, to work differently for kids. A caveat, uh, once we hit Sparta, so Mandy and I have been presenting, once we hit Sparta, we take Troy's name off that. We just claim it as our own. <laughs> Don't tell him. Oh, all right. So as Kurt talked about, we have our structure of how we're going to do this now. We're just getting started with our system of care administrator, um, but have a lot of intentions for our future and what that will look like. So we've been very strategic about how we have set this up. You heard Kurt mention a little bit earlier that this isn't county owned, this isn't school owned. This is truly our intention is for this to be community owned. So that it's not somebody working for La Crosse County and we only send county kids then through it, right? We want the community to really take advantage and own this. So our intention is that, this, that the system of care become a 501c3, a nonprofit. It, it positions us well as a community for a number of reasons. First of all, it positions us to be just that, community owned. Right? We sit in a place where we can become a backbone organization for other endeavors that are going on within our community that really focus on youth and getting them healthy in a number of different ways. So our system of care is really designed, number one, to assess. We're going into this being very individualized with how we're going to work with each of the kids that are, that are referred to us. Really it's about, you know, that iceberg, right? So the behaviors that we're maybe seeing in a classroom or in a hallway, eventually the, the behaviors we're seeing in a park or in mom and dad's home, are really the tip of that iceberg. And we can't get to the bottom of it until we really further assess where that stuff is coming from. So the big FUs in the hallway that could be considered disorderly conduct are probably hurt, anger, right, sadness, all that other stuff. But if we don't ask those questions or we don't have somebody that is, has the time to ask those questions, we're never going to get to the bottom of it. We've created somebody who has some time to start asking those questions and connect those kids to the right places. We're lucky also that we live in a community that is very resource rich, but we do have some gaps when it comes to the types of services available for kids within our community and families within our community. And so we want to be, again, strategic about how we set this up. Being a nonprofit positions us to be av uh, eligible for grant opportunities that a government agency may not. So the school district or La Crosse County might not be able to go for, but a, a nonprofit would be able to go for. We hope that we can collaborate within our community then on these endeavors to work together with one another on how we can fill those gaps for the kids within our community. And then finally, integrating approaches, those policies, practices, use of community programs. We have somebody that can really collaborate with each of our agencies to ensure that we're maximizing what our resources look like, who's using them, who knows about them, how we can get our kids involved in them. So we wanted to be, again, very strategic about this. Our mission with our system of care, ensuring children and youth remain in school and ready to learn through an integrated system of supports designed to keep them out of the criminal justice system, mentally healthy, and safe from abuse and neglect. This three-legged stool that so often goes with hand in hand with one another, right? The kids that we work with in the juvenile justice system, our child protection have seen many times, 
right, in their, in their youth when they were younger. And our, our therapists within the community are ho either hopefully seeing them or going to be seeing them because of mental health issues that they might be struggling with. So many of these things go hand in hand with one another. And so this is that three-legged stool that our system of care will stand on to really get our kids healthy within our community and thriving in a better direction. Our efforts are not something that we're just pulling out of the sky and making up. Kurt mentioned our system of care that was um, that uh, is in Clayton County, Georgia. Uh, we are modeling many of our efforts out of what we learned from Judge Teske's team. We've put our own little spin on our system of care to make it even more individualized than than Clayton County has. So the, the compression planning that we were able to go through a year and a half ago with their team, we took it and ran with it because we know that we can do even better, that we can really start in, to look at kids and the individualized needs that each of them have and target those needs specific to them, that we're not going to do a, a checkbox approach. Cuyahoga County is also doing some really great work in this, in this direction, having a backbone organization in New York um, that really focuses in on getting kids and families connected within their community without having to be involved in the system. So our structure, as we put ourselves together as this, as this community partner um, out there, we also want the structure and the executive committee to have a voice from each of our agencies. So anyone who has that potential for decision making along the line, anywhere from the, the school office administrator all the way up to the judge on the bench, we want a voice at that table to be able to give perspective as to where the system of care goes. So you can see the structure that we've put together, school, law enforcement, county juvenile justice, the district attorney, the court system, and as we scale up, others will have a voice at that table to kind of see how, how the system of care will run. And all of it will be run by our system of care administrator, who's on day two today. <laughs> um, Bridget Todd, if you want to stand, put a face to a name, was hired as our system of care administrator. I'll applaud that. <laughs> Um, started yesterday with us and really will be able to take so much of the work that we've been talking and working so hard to focus on. Kurt and I can kind of get back to our day jobs because um, we got Bridget who we know that we will be in good hands to really take this vision and be able to run with it. Now this you have to understand comes with major commitments, right? You can't just make positions happen in our community without some commitments. And so that's where we put our money where our mouth is. We believe so strongly that this door is going to be such a great option for our community that La Crosse County and the school district have partnered up to put our money where our mouth is and, and have been able to fund this position. Um, we see this as something that uh, is very much supported by our school board, our county board, um, you know, got great applause and, and support moving forward with this and we see it growing and expanding um, as we move. So like Kurt talked about, you know, we're starting with La Crosse School District. We're starting because La Crosse School District is really in a good place. You guys were having these conversations a long time ago. So how can we help and support one another and getting those conversations to be community-wide? As we look to how we scale up in the future, the process is the key with all of this. Without the conversations that we've had for the last three years, um, everybody getting on the same page, everybody understanding how one another works, without those basis conversations, we weren't gonna get to where we are. Now we have a structure. So when West Salem or Holman, who you saw were already at our table and taking part in some of these conversations, are interested in accessing the system of care, it's not just about how do I make a referral, it's about where you at culturally in your school? How do we work together as a system? How do we understand one another before that even becomes available? Because that's the important piece in all of this. Those conversations, that understanding, that knowledge of how we, how we fit together as a system is what makes this. And also could be what breaks us. But that's why we want to be people-proof. That's why we went back to that MOU. That's why we structured it in such a way that we can move forward and our intentions live on long beyond us. And so this is our structure. 
this is, this is where we're at today. We are just in the beginning phases. I'm excited for next year to hopefully be able to talk to you about outcomes we're beginning to see and things of that nature. Um, because there's going to be twists and turns along the road, as there always is with new endeavors. But we couldn't be more thankful to have a system um, around this table that's been willing to be vulnerable with us, that have been willing to take some internal looks at how we can make changes and do things differently, have been open to new ideas, and truly have been ultimately supportive in every fashion possible. possible. Um, to make this happen. So um, that's all we have as far as our presentation for where we're at, where we hope to go, and things of that nature. We're curious if anyone has had any wheels turn in and have any questions for us as far as what you saw here today. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, any conversation that has gone on with this group has been obviously very much anecdotal, right? Um, but it's a conversation, they're conversations that need to happen, right? I mean, w within the, the nation, our country, and what's going on, and right out in, in our back door, these are conversations that need to be happening. And we're thankful that we've been able to have them, that we've created such strong relationships with one another now that we can go there as well. So when you see that a piece of our work is really about sitting next to one another and having those deeper conversations about culture and how we bring our own individual biases to the decisions that we make every day, that's a part of this trip, right? That's a part of what we're doing here. So we talk about institutional racism, we talk about individual biases, we talk we, we need to talk about those things and how they impact the decisions that we make every day. So that's why it's such an important piece of what the work that we're doing is right now. So as we talked about, those um, you guys just had your, your social justice initiative here a couple weeks ago, and we do have the kind of the, a, another deeper dive into more of that individual um, impact and bias that we may bring coming up in the fall that you guys will get more information on. So. Alicia. Right. So right now our focus is on middle and high schools. Yep, you're right. Um, I can say from my office that I've seen some elementary students cross my desk and it, ma you know, it makes me really sad and I'm hopeful that we don't have to go in that direction when it comes to our elementary level of things. Um, right now our focus continues to be middle and high school as we scale up and see the capacities that system of care might have. There's no telling what kind of directions we might be able to go, um, but at this point are staying very focused. Well, and I can speak a little bit if you have something to add, but, uh, you know, like I said before, we're, we're lucky in that we're very resource rich, but we're not, we're not in up to that. We, we have those weights here, too. The, the pretty awesome thing that I think is that we have some pretty amazing initiatives going on. So we have a mental health grant that was just awarded a fairly large one within our community that we plan to work very closely with, right? So we have a lot of initiatives that are going on within our community right now that we don't, uh, just like this work has been, we don't want to do in a silo. So how do we not only find gaps for our juveniles, but how do we find gaps in our mental health system and how can we fill those gaps collaboratively with one another? So though, in my opinion, those are conversations that we need to have across, right? Across lines, because they so go hand in hand. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and I think uh, some of our work just around systems improvement. So what we what we sometimes find, and and we're going to be presenting uh, 
uh, not Mandy and I, but um, the school district on our system of integrated supports is um, sometimes when we find uh, the kids in these situations, they have very complex needs, that it's not just linear, it's not just their mental health, it could be the mental health of a caregiver, it could be some of the dynamics within the home. And our systems are really moving, as we talked about, system of care being able to respond sooner, sooner working upstream, so to speak. Um, we're really building a lot of uh, capacity as a school district to be able to mobilize wraparound teams and, and for us to be able to respond sooner so that the old, you know, uh, our, our services end here and we have to wait for their, they're eligible, right? They commit enough crime or they've been mistreated, you know, to whatever that measure is or they're, or they're this mentally ill that they qualify. We're going to be working in that gap. Uh, and that's really the upstream thinking of rebuilding for learning, integrated supports, our work around juvenile justice, um, that that uh, we're deconstructing a wait to fail model. So, yeah. It isn't posted anywhere publicly. <laughs> We'll give you a password afterward <laughs> and uh, tell you about a guy to talk to. And now we, uh, it's something we haven't talked about. It was, um, you know, where that's going to be housed and posted. But um, yeah, great, well, and I can great thought. Add on, on, I mean, every one of the signers. So every school district, Randy Nelson has a copy. You know, so every system has a copy of the MOU to share with its people. The courts have a copy, the DA's office has a copy, our office has a copy. Every, all, all agencies that were a part of this have a copy. It's not a secret. So if you're interested, I, I would say if you're from the school district, get in touch with Randy. If you're from the county, you can certainly get in touch with me. Jason has it. You know, there are plenty of us around that would be able to share that without a doubt. We just don't have a mechanism. So at this point, the board is still being structured. Um, but what we envision is that it would be the administrators of each of those agencies or an appointee. So from the school district, Randy would appoint who that representative would be. Chief of police would appoint or be himself, things of that nature. Yep. We also see um, other sorts of gr uh, committee members as being part of it. We're like. Like Mandy said, we're not sure what that'll look like, um, but there will be a, a core group who will kind of monitor um, or support the seed money that's going into actually establishing it. Um, but the other communities who've developed systems like this, when Mandy talked about, you know, we're eligible for grants through a system of care that we're not as public agencies, um, like the uh, uh, down in Atlanta, they're getting, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in grants um, to be able to administer. Uh, supports. We applied unsuccessfully, no round of applause needed, for a $40,000 grant. Um, but part of that was we put our, the, the timeline didn't allow us to actually have the system up in place. But if we can compete for grants and show this is a true collective impact model, um, I think we're going to be eligible for uh, some, some very uh, uh, meaningful grant dollars out there to mobilize supports for kids. All right. Well, that's all we have. I really appreciate you coming to visit with us about this and look forward to our work together.